Okay, so water vapor pressure or vapor pressure we just said was the, we're starting guys, is the pressure of the vapor over a certain liquid in a closed container. So if this is water, it's going to have enough molecules at the surface that are going to get enough kinetic energy to be in gaseous form. And these molecules are going to have a pressure and create pressure by running into each other and the size of the container. Um, what I want us to be able to get to today is the relationship between intermolecular forces and vapor pressure. So there's going to be a lot of graphical interpretation on the AP now, so I want you to um, start becoming less afraid of these types of graphs. And if you look, we've got three different compounds, and we're plotting different vapor pressures um, at different temperatures. So just looking as temperature increases, in general, what happens to vapor pressure? Increases. What makes that happen? Why? More molecules leaving the liquid because they have more energy now. So looking at the three things we're comparing, hydrogen bonding to ethanol, this is called diethyl ether. It's your little hydrogen chain, and then you've got your oxygen, and then you've got your other hydrogen chain. Okay, well, I keep saying hydrogen chain. I'm really tired. Carbon chain. So you've got your carbon chain surrounding your oxygen. So let's talk about intermolecular forces. This molecule is nonpolar, so what would the intermolecular force be primarily London dispersion? Alcohol, what's in that? This is a polar molecule because of the OH coming off, and that is going to create a situation where we have hydrogen bonding. Water is polar, and what's its intermolecular force? Hydrogen bond. All right, so London dispersion means that there's a lot or a little interaction between, or attraction between those molecules in the liquid phase. Little. So with little attraction, do you think we'll have more vapor or less vapor at a certain temperature? More. And that is the case. If we were to pick a temperature where we actually have values for all the vapor pressures, like here, we can see that London dispersion forced diethyl ether there is going to have the highest vapor pressure because it's least attracted in the, in the liquid phase. That's why things that are volatile smell, they're, they're more apt to be in that um, gas phase. So now we're comparing two things out of hydrogen bonding. Ethyl, ethyl alcohol or ethanol has a higher vapor pressure than water. That means it's less attracted to other ethanol molecules than water is to itself. My question is, they're both hydrogen bonding. Why would ethyl to alcohols be different? Huh? No, not, not intra. It has to do with the intermolecular forces. Any ideas? Water has a super, super, super strong hydrogen bonding relationship. Why? Exactly. There's two. It's got double areas where hydrogen bonding can occur. So we're going to have a higher intermolecular force, which is going to make our vapor pressure less. So if I asked for a statement relating vapor pressure to intermolecular force, the higher the IMF, the stronger the IMF, the what the vapor pressure? The lower the vapor pressure. And I need you to understand that. The stronger the intermolecular force, the lower the vapor pressure. And this graph is showing that very clearly and simply. So let's move on. Um, here I have a picture of a container. If I were to take this water bottle and put water in it and close it up, the first thing that happens is I don't have any vapor in there right away. Okay, vapor is going to have to start to form. So um, if I were to ask you, and this is important for the pre-lab, because this is in one of the pre-lab questions, what's an equation that would represent what's going on here? Water. What's going on? What is the water doing? Evaporating. So it's going from Yes, H2O liquid to H2O gas. There is a pre-lab question that says find, using thermodynamic values to find the heat of vaporization of water, you would do big mama on this, products minus reactants, okay? So does everyone get that? Because this is water vaporizing. So anyway, when we first put this 
water in here, we don't have any gas. So this reaction proceeds in a forward direction until we reach a point where energy kind of levels out, no more molecules have any additional energy to go into gas phase. And so we all of a sudden end up at equilibrium H2O gas. So for every one molecule at that point that goes into gaseous phase, one will come back into liquid and it goes back and forth and back and forth. But we get to a point where we see no net change in the amount of gas we have or the amount of liquid that we have. And that takes a little bit of time to happen. All right, so description of this on this slide just basically says pressure of the vapor present at equilibrium is vapor pressure. This is about what vapor pressure is. Vapor pressure is the pressure of the vapor pressure at equilibrium. In other words, we're not looking at the pressure here. We've got to wait. Once it hits equilibrium, we can then count that. That's by definition what vapor pressure is. The system is at equilibrium when no net change occurs in the amount of liquid or vapor. So now let's answer this question because this, this is a can of worms here. What is the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees Celsius equal to? What is it equal to? All right, so this is kind of convoluted. First question I want to ask you is what happens at water at 100 degrees Celsius? It, it boils, it changes state. It boils, meaning it goes from liquid to gas at that very point. Correct? All right, so if I have all these water molecules at exactly 100, that starts to happen, yes? This kind of creates a pressure. At the point where we're at equilibrium, right at that point of boiling, the pressure up and the pressure down are the same. So what would the pressure of the vapor be at boiling? Not zero. The pressure up and the pressure down are the same. What's pushing down on this? the atmosphere. That's what boiling point is. Boiling point is when the atmospheric pressure at is equal to the vapor pressure. This is a very advanced definition of boiling point. It's not just, oh, when liquid becomes gas. This is explaining what's going on in terms of pressure. Does that make sense? Boiling point is when the atmospheric pressure is equal to the vapor pressure. So what is the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees Celsius? It is the atmospheric pressure, which, if it were standard, what would it be? 1 atm. The term normal, if you hear, oh, it's normal pressure, that's referring to standard pressure. So anytime you see the word normal, that's STP, standard it's not STP, sorry, it's standard pressure, not temperature. It's just normal pressure means one atmosphere. I don't know if this is at normal pressure because it isn't saying the problem, but I do know that the vapor pressure will be equal to whatever pressure above is pushing down on that liquid. Make sense? So now you know the fancy definition for boiling point. And we're going to talk more when we get to colligative properties on Tuesday. All right, so here are the... Uh, ghetto old-time barometers back in the day. We don't see them. Now they look more like that little round thing that we have on the back that you all looked at for the, for the gas law lab. Barometer, barometer. And um, originally, we know that this is where 760 came from because it was 760, not tor. 760 what did we measure? Millimeters of mercury. So here we have mercury in this dish. Mercury was placed into a tube that had nothing else in it, so it's a vacuum. And if we were to have this dish of mercury with nothing else in there, the only thing that's happening is the atmosphere is pressing, pressing down on it. When 1 atm presses down on this, the length of this column is 760 torr. Okay? So what we can also use barometers for is not just to measure the pressure of the atmosphere, we can utilize it with pressure of the atmosphere to find vapor pressure, pressure of different gases. So we're revisiting the same gases that were plotted before. And what we could do is put in our water vapor here and let it reach equilibrium. And in this case, we have 
two pressures fighting each other. We have the vapor pressure of the gas pushing down here and the vapor pressure of the atmosphere pushing down that way. So we get this fight. So watch my hands. This is the gas pushing down in the atmosphere. They're going like this with each other until they reach equilibrium. Once they reach equilibrium, you can measure now the height of this column. This column at, at normal atmosphere is normally 760, right? But it's not. Now it's only 736. So how much vapor pressure then must be pushing down on it? You subtract and you get 24. So that's the vapor pressure of water. That's pretty dang low. Why is water's vapor pressure so low again? Hydrogen bonding, intermolecular forces. Very strong polar molecule. Okay? All right, next one. Here we have that diethyl ether. No, sorry, that's diethyl ether. Here we have our um, ethanol. This is kind of between the both. Um, our 760 column is actually shortened to 695 because we got more vapor pressure, making that column shorter. And so we get a difference of 65 torr. And that's only got one area for hydrogen bonding, so it's not going to be as high of a vapor pressure because the intermolecular forces are smidge less. And finally, man, this is so freaking nonpolar that it's jumping into vapor phase like crazy. So we have a super high vapor pressure, teeny column now, 760 minus 215, giving us a big fat vapor pressure of 545. London dispersion forces, very little attraction, high vapor pressure. Okay, see so how comfortable subtracting that kind of thing? Um, I could see maybe these showing up, not necessarily on your test. I don't. I'm not putting this on your test, but I just don't want you to freak out if you see them on the AP. Okay, let's move on. This is just another version of the same chart, exact same chart you had earlier, but prettier and in color, comparing the three different intermolecular forces and their vapor pressures at different temperatures. I could see them asking tons of questions just by giving you this one graph. Okay, don't be afraid of the graphs. All right. Introducing a very important equation you do not need to memorize. But what's important about this equation, it gives us another way to find a delta H. But it's a specific delta H. What do you think delta H VAP is? The heat of vaporization, meaning heat required to do what? to vaporize or, what's another word for vaporize? One word for vaporize. One word for vaporize. Evaporate, I'll take evaporate, I'm looking for another one. Oh guys, it's easy. Boil. Isn't boiling vaporizing, right? So it's the amount of heat required to vaporize or boil a substance. You can use the relationship of Clausius-Clapeyron in order to figure out the heat of vaporization in a couple ways. This is the full-fledged equation where you'd need, kind of like ordered pairs, you'd need to know the vapor pressure, the pressure of vaporization at a certain temperature, and another set. You need another pressure of vaporization at a different temperature, and then you can plug them in and solve. And then you can solve by multiplying by R, and it has to be the energy R, 8.31, not the gas R, and you can figure out what the vapor pressure is. I don't know if you all know, I have a really, really old cat, right? And I believe in buying cats in pairs because they're lonely, and they, especially when they're kittens. Kittens are so hard to own when they're little and they're by themselves because they bother you all night long. They're, they won't stop hitting you, and you breathe, and you, they swap you in the face, and all this kind of stuff. So anyway. If I get another set, I've been like struggling with names. So either Clausius Clapeyron, Klaus and Cla Clausius, or there's another equation we do in the spring called Henderson Hasselbach. Might do that one. I can't decide. So that would be four cats. No, I want Clausius and Clapeyron. Cat? Yeah. I don't mind this. I think those are cool names. Some people are like, what's Clapeyron? It sounds like a disease. Um, but anyway, so I don't know why I tell that story, but I just 
I'm trying to come up with a, some cool cat names. But anyway, you guys are going to be doing a lab where you're going to, and it's going to be an online lab because this is a nightmare lab to actually perform. Measuring pressure, vapor pressures at different temperatures is so hard. You think it would be easy, but anytime there's a leak in a tube or the seal of the Erlenmeyer, and so the data is horrible. So we're just going to do the online version of it. But basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be collecting vapor pressures and temperatures, ordered pairs, and you're going to have to graph it. You can also take Clausius Clapeyron and do what we say linearize it. Do you see that? So if we have what would go on the x-axis, 1 over temperature, and on the y-axis, you put the natural log of pressures. So you do that whole manipulation in the lists in your calculator, take the natural log of all the pressures, do 1 over all the temperatures, and you're going to graph it. Okay. And when you graph, and I can't remember if the slope is going to be negative or positive. Heat of vaporization has to be putting heat in. So it has to be, what, positive, right? So I'm just making sure my slope's working. So um, that would be a positive slope. So the slope then is equal to what? Delta H over R. Do you see that? That's what the slope is equal to? Yes, y'all? Wake up. <laughs> All right. So how would I find heat of vaporization then? That would, that's what you're doing in the lab. How do I find heat of vaporization? I, I plotted my stuff in the calculator. I got slope. Then plug it in. Wait, what do you mean, plug it in where? Here? Yeah, so just do what to the slope? Multiply it by R. Take the slope, multiply it by R, and that will give you heat of, the, heat of vaporization in joules. Okay? So as far as units go, my temperatures would have to be in what unit? Kelvin. What about my pressure? What happens to the units of pressure here? Yeah, they cancel. So you can use any unit of pressure. It doesn't matter. Whatever pressures you have, but they have to be the same, obviously. You can't do millimeters of mercury in one and atmospheres in the other. As long as they're in the same unit, you can plot any type of pressure and take the natural log of it and then do the same for this. So let's just go ahead and quickly do a little solving action using Clausius Clapeyron. What time does this end? Oh, geez. Okay, y'all get your calculators out. We've got to do this quick. The vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.8 torr. The heat of vaporization is... 43.9 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the vapor pressure of water. Um, I don't know what I'm writing there. I want PVAP. We're looking for the vapor pressure of water at 65 degrees Celsius. So what we have here is the need for Clausius Clapeyron. This would be T1. This could be my P1. This could be T2. This could be my P2. I like labeling them so when I go to plug in the equation, I don't mess, mess things up. This is the heat of vaporization. What's R? 8.314 joules per mole K. So now I can plug this into Clausius Clapeyron for time because the bell's going to ring and I need to do one more slide. I'm going to put it in and then I'm going to give you the answer and I need you to make sure you know how to do your natural logs and solve for that on your own. But if I'm plugging it in, Okay, I don't remember. Is it 2 over 1 or 1 over 2? 1 over 2. Can I put Tor in? Yeah, that's okay. So I'm going to put that over P2 is equal to, now, it's delta H over R. What's wrong with my delta H? It's in kilojoules. So I need to do 43,900 joules per mole over R is 8.314 joules per mole K. Then I'm going to multiply by, I'm out of room, 1 over, what's first, T2 or 1? T1? So T2 is first? Okay, so I do 273 plus 65 minus 1 over 25 plus 273, I know is 298. So this is what I'd put in. To mathematically solve for this, I want you to figure out what the number is on this side, write it down. Okay, so let's say we have... Um, the LN of 238.2, whatever, is equal to, we get a number and it's W. I'm just 
calling it W for fun. Then what we do, we take the natural log, we go E to V on both sides, and that makes this go away. So I'm left with 238, I mean 23.8 over P is equal to whatever number I get by going E to that power in the calculator, which is the second LN button. That's how I solve it, and if you solve it, you should get 193.7 TOR. So go ahead and make sure you try this, because you will have one of these on the test. You'll probably have it on the group quiz and everything. So make sure you can mathematically do that manipulation. All of you should be in or have already taken Algebra 2, so this should be a no-brainer. Okay, last thing we need to figure out. Oh, crap, the bell's going to ring. Heating curve, solid, liquid, gas. That is the heat to melt. Does anyone know another name for melting? FUS, fusion, good. The heat of melting, and then this is the heat of vaporization we already talked about. Why is the heat of vaporization lar longer, larger, more energy, why is more energy required to vaporize something than to fuse it? Perfect. The molecules here are so spread apart, you're basically having to overcome all, those, all the IMFs here. You're like busting open those molecules. So they have very little attraction for each other anymore. Here, what are you doing when you melt solid ice? You're just kind of going, ugh, and the molecules are just still close, not exactly as close, but still pretty close. So that doesn't take as much energy. So that, if you're ever asked, Heat of vaporization is always larger than heat of fusion of a substance. And now we are done.